Hey, DeFiers, Kevin here with Defiancy. Happy New Year to you as we look into this new year of 2022. I know we have a lot of big plans here in 2022 with Defiancy, and I hope that you have some huge plans as well. So let's jump right into the Defiancy Insight. Today we're going to talk about phone, which is looking at these layer ones, uh, Phantom, Algorand, Osmosis, Near Protocol. These are things to take a look at. You need to be aware of. We're going to cover those today. We're going to talk about the top DeFi news, what's happening in the world of DeFi, what's happening in the world of NFTs with the top NFT news, and then a look at the market structure so you can see where are things at right now, potentially what can we see in the near term as we look into 2022 to best position ourselves. So without further ado, let's hop right into today's Defiance Insight. <laughs> What is going on, everybody? This is Andrew from Defiancy. All right, so let's start off with kind of the hot narrative right now. So over the last few days, there's been a lot of hype around alternative layer ones. There's actually an acronym for this, and I'm showing it to you right now um, on my screen. It's called FOAN. I don't know if that's how you pronounce that. But what that stands for is Phantom, Osmosis, Algorand, and Near. These are all L1 protocols. And I, I'm, I'm showing you this tweet here because this is actually a pretty remarkable phenomenon. Basically an entire narrative, um, which is quite substantial in terms of price appreciation for these assets is almost completely derived from a few people. I don't know how to pronounce this, guy, this guy's uh, handle here, but it's like Haska Trades. This guy is like a legendary momentum trader and literally him almost exclusively with the help of a few other people have pretty much moved the markets they tweet about this they show people that they're in a position and other people follow and it's just like an avalanche effect and we saw this um, really illustrated earlier in 2021 with soluna avax or so yeah i guess that's pronounced solana vax which is solana luna and AVAX. So basically what's going on here, and this is important to note, this is not really fundamentals here that are driving the prices of these layer ones. Now, to be fair, there is some news stories and stuff and uh, developments within these ecosystems that, you know, make sense for people to, you know, take positions on them. But a lot of this is really just crypto Twitter, crypto influencer hype. And it's very interesting how, I mean, it's a meme, basically. Uh, Foan, Saluna, Avax is a meme. And it's working. And that's really what we're seeing here is people rotating in and out of uh, layer one protocols that haven't pumped yet. So a good example, would another good example would be Harmony 1, which is the one token. It hasn't really had like this ultra parabolic run. So people are going to, you're going to see more and more uh, of this token. People not, they're not going to hype and tell you why you should buy it. They're just going to just create a meme out of it. And you will see it go up, I think. Assuming we don't have some kind of big pullback in the overall market, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But if you've been noticing on um, CoinGecko, uh, let's go over there real quick. I thought I had this open. You're going to see that the top coins right now in terms of uh, price appreciation over the last um, you know, several days has been alternative layer ones for the most part. Internet computer, layer one. Cosmos, layer one. Salo, pretty much a layer one. Um, Phantom, Osmosis, Hedora Hashgraph, or Hedera Hashgraph, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, harmony, right? So this is the narrative right now. Now this is temporary, and I don't expect for this just to keep going, you know, for, for too much longer. But this is kind of the explanation for that. Okay, um, let's talk about some of the things going on in DeFi. So over the last week or so, really going into Christmas break, um, we've had this kind of emergence of, um, I guess. Uh, attention and understanding of what's going on and, and with, within the curve wars, as they're calling it now. Basically, there's been a lot of media outlets that have started to cover curve and the different protocols that are at war with each other to accumulate it. That's what I should have started off saying. Basically, curve is a token, it's a governance token, 
um, that allows you to um, you know vote on the curve protocol. But it's an interesting protocol token because it, it in and of itself, the curve token um, can bring uh, can generate revenues. So by you holding the curve token, you can actually uh, receive revenue from the fees that are uh, gained uh, throughout the protocol when transactions occur. This is a DEX if you don't if you don't know what Curve is. It's a, it's like the Uniswap, but it is a DEX for stable coins. And the reason why you need a Curve like protocol is because going between let's say USDT and USDC is actually not that easy to do efficiently on Uniswap or sushi swap. So this is specifically designed to trade between like assets. And it's used a lot in DeFi. So you probably if, if you're keeping up with the DeFi space and doing research, you're probably going to see more and more about curve and hence why its price has done pretty well over the last uh, few weeks. Okay, so this is something that is not immediately going to be recognized as important, but I want to bring this to people early because I think it is very important going forward. And that is Aave um, potentially um, going to be deployed on StarkNet. So potentially they might be deployed on StarkNet. So this is, this is a big deal because StarkNet is a layer 2 um, ZK base rollup. Um, on top of Ethereum and it's a lot of people in the space believe that once these layer 2 ZK rollups and also optimistic rollups are, are, are live and, and offering incentives to the users to get to go there in the first place that you're just going to see an explosion of applications and development on top of Ethereum layer 1. So this is the first big project to potentially be uh, launching on on this CK rollup based Starknet, so I think this is a really big deal. This is a this is going to be a narrative that's going to grow slowly, and then everyone's going to be like, "Where did this come from?" But it's it's going to take a few, a few months to build up and coil up. I expect to see a ridiculous amount of attention on Starknet, optimistic rollups, CK rollups in general, Polygon ecosystem, the layer two solutions that is. Um, here, you know, as we get closer to the merge, um, which could be, you know, May or April or, or March or something like that, maybe later. Um, but I want to I want to bring this to people early because this is going to be a huge narrative and it will be a profitable profitable one. The people who get into some of these layer two uh, technologies early. OK, so let's move on a little bit away from, I guess, uh, typical DeFi. This is an interesting story I wanted to talk about because a lot of people don't know this is actually possible. And we're going to talk about the implications of this. So Tether froze like a million dollars that someone had in an account, in an Ethereum account. And this is significant because, number one, a lot of people don't believe that's possible. They think, oh, crypto, I send it back and forth, no one can freeze it, no one can blacklist it, blah, 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 which is not true. That actually is not true. USDT is a smart contract on top of Ethereum and other blockchains, and yes, they can. They can effectively, I mean, they're not reversing transactions, but they can effectively reverse a transaction. They can't go and actually reverse a transaction that's been settled on Ethereum, but they can basically stop it um, they can they can freeze your account, and then they could re they could issue different uh, uh, that that same amount of tether in a different way. Like let's say that someone stole your tether, okay, and you could prove it that someone stole. So going forward, this is probably going to happen. You know, someone steals some money tether, and they can fr they can seize it, freeze it, and then issue new tether to replace it. So this answers a lot of people's concerns or questions about, well, how do you reverse fraud and all this stuff? It is possible to do that already. Tether can do it. USDC, I believe, can do it in similar ways. So the whole idea that, you know, that all of this is completely irreversible is true theoretically, but can I, there actually is ways on the application layer, smart contract layer, to have like a system where, yeah, like. Let's say that you're doing some bad stuff. 
You can have your account frozen, the USDT that is, or USDC. Okay, that doesn't mean they can freeze your Ethereum or die or something like that. It has to be built in from the smart contract level. But I want people to realize that this is going to have major implications going forward for regulators. They're, they're going to want to do this. In fact, if they can't do this, they're not going to like this system. They're going to have to have the assurance that if some kind of fraudulent activity happens, that they can control it. Right? And here's your solution. I'm not saying that this is a good precedent, um, but it's definitely something that's going to be you know, used in our financial system as blockchain becomes more integrated, right? Okay, let's move on. I think this is the last thing I have for DeFi. So this is more than just DeFi, but I want to talk about this because people are really, really sleeping on this. So Coinbase has a lot of very smart people and I did a contract with a startup that um, we worked with Coinbase and one thing I learned by working with them was how serious they were about being ahead like in terms of uh, you know, getting into these protocols figuring out ways to build products well in advance like they, they were working on layer 2 stuff that people are just now talking about like a year ago. So they've been they've been doing this for a while and they're thinking very deeply about how to take advantage of the Ethereum ecosystem in general and just you know blockchain in general. And the fact that Coinbase is coming out and taking the position that no, look, Ethereum scaling improvements are actually coming and we're going to onboard users. That's what this article basically says. We are going to you know I'm paraphrasing it. I think you can um, draw conclusions off this information and say they are going to be onboarding users directly to layer two rollups. Okay, to your Starknet, to your Optimism, to your Arbitrum, whatever. Okay, there's only a few of them available right now that they actually could, which is Arbitrum and Optimism. Uh, Crypto.com already has support directly to Arbitrum. As this happens, this is going to change the narrative in terms of the whole layer one race and competition. Because once layer twos are very cheap and fast and they're secure, meaning they don't have any of the training wheels that are in place on things like Arbitrum right now that make it a little bit less secure, once those are gone, you're likely to see a much different ecosystem and a much different conversation about things like Solana, Avalanche, Phantom, Near. At, th at that point, they probably start to position themselves as a layer two. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. I think Solana is the least likely to to do this, but I do think thing, you know protocols like Avalanche and Near, very good chance that they may become a layer two solution, a, a roll up um, on top of Ethereum as this plays out. All right, let's move on. So NFTs, NFTs, NFTs. Um, Man, there's so much to talk about with NFTs. It's like when I pick these things to talk about, it's like I could sit here and make <laughs> hours and hours of video content. But I wanted to introduce this because I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, Samsung saying that they're going to you know, add some kind of NFT functionality into their, their TVs. Is that going to be useful? I don't know. Like, like are people actually going to want to use that or even know what they're doing? I don't know. But the fact that they're talking about this is a big deal. What I'm, you know, what I'm getting from um, a lot of this NFT stuff is it's very difficult for these companies to jump into DeFi because it is, it's finance and there's so much red tape and regulation and risk. But with NFTs, although it really is still finance in a way, it is seen differently. They, they feel like companies, corporations, existing infrastructure feels like they, they can jump into the NFT space with significantly less risk than DeFi. And I, that's why you're seeing a lot of these bold uh, announcements and stuff, or maybe not bold, but you're just seeing this at nauseum over and over and over. Every day we wake up, there's some kind of new company or some big company saying they're doing something with NFTs, right? And it's because they can, and there's not a whole lot of risk to them, and they're going to be competitive. They realize NFTs are the future. They realize if they don't get into NFTs, it's going to be like them not getting in the internet or getting on the internet in the 90s. So they're going to aggressively attack 
the NFT space and try to and try to grab a lot of the quote unquote land right now. I don't know. I'm not talking about real estate, but it's a land grab, right? Getting talent and and, and just positioning yourself in the NFT NFT space in general. Um, this is a pretty big deal, okay? And then you know we had Slim Shady Eminem. He bought a board ape. Uh, I just, I would, you probably already seen this. I was just going to mention it. You know, pretty big deal. He, he has it as his profile picture on Twitter. I think we've had so many celebrities get into the NFT space that this is almost not even news anymore. Uh, South Korean, uh, South Korean, excuse me, presidential candidate is going to use NFTs to raise funds um, for his campaign. I don't know how big of a candidate this guy is. Lee J. Myung. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but. Um, Looks like he's going to be, you know, using NFTs to raise money for his campaign. Big deal, in my opinion. Big deal. Kind of like um, similar to uh, Melania Trump. You know, she's into NFTs. Uh, she's probably going to try to use NFTs for Trump's presidential race, assuming he runs in 2024. I bet. I bet in some way. All right, let's move on here. This is interesting. I want to spend a little bit of time on this one. So... Square Enix is a video game um, company. They they created uh, Final Fantasy um, and, a, and probably a lot more games than that. But that, that's a big one that I know of, which was a game I played as a kid. Huge game. A lot of people played it. I don't think people realize how big this gaming um, hype is going to be in this space here in a few months. I don't want to put a timeline on it. But all it's going to take is a few of these companies to execute a plan, a strategy on how to profit from blockchain, the metaverse, and NFTs. And it is going to go off like a wildfire. You just look at DeFi Kingdom right now. Okay, let's, let's go to DeFi Kingdom. If you don't know what that is, it's a game um, that allows you to... It's basically DeFi with a, with a gaming front interface built on top of it. So it has exchanges and, and yield farms and stuff built into it. And you trade NFTs. And it's gamified. Look at the market cap of this. It's got a, it's got a $1.3 billion market cap. $10.6 billion fully diluted value. It has reportedly about $700 million locked into the protocol. Um, just look at this run here over the last few months. I mean, absolutely parabolic. I think I got in, I bought some of this at like $3 or something. It, well, it actually wasn't on, excuse me, it wasn't on CoinGecko at one point. But it was down here in like, you know, $1, one range not too long ago. And it's at, you know, $21 right now. So I'm mentioning this to say this game is not even that... I mean, look, it's it's interesting and it's fun and, and like I, I played it, but to me, this is, I mean, look, there's going to be a lot better games. Let's just say that. And once a real game that people really want to play, I mean, that are like, like a game that people play now, and it has blockchain integrated with it, with DeFi and NFTs and stuff like that, it is going to absolutely crush these metrics we're seeing here. If this can get to a $1.3 billion market cap, Look, I'm not hating on DeFi Kingdom. I love, I love them. I love their team. I was an early investor. They were at a conference I was at, and it was, it was amazing what they were doing at this conference. I'm a big believer. But when someone or when a, when a group of people with like heavy gaming experience in the industry create a game that people want to play, like World of Warcraft, like with NFTs and DeFi built into it, it is going to go crazy. If this can go crazy, we're going to see some ridiculous stuff, I think, here coming, you know, coming pretty soon with games maybe like Alluvium. If you don't know what Alluvium is, I hope that you take the time to look into this game. The, to me, this is this is going to be huge and not just the token itself. Who knows, you know, how well this token will do, will do. It's at like, you know, over 600 million dollar market cap. But the NFTs and stuff that you can buy for this game I think are going to be incredible. It, like the actual gameplay looks like nothing we've seen yet in the blockchain space, blockchain gaming. So I, I'm thinking this is going to be probably um, maybe the biggest game of the year. And there's several several others, excuse me, that we're going to talk about. We're going to create more videos on this stuff, but I want to put this on everybody's radar here. 
Okay, so let's let's finish this off. Some closing thoughts. This is very important here, guys. This 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 um, open interest situation we have. So, if you don't know what open interest is, open interest is it's basically it's a metric that you can follow that shows like like how interested people in are are at trading um, derivatives. Um, when you have a like high open interest, it usually means people are over leveraged, and it can mean in either direction. Um, right now, we have over leverage. What it seems like in both directions, so meaning uh, we're probably going to have an explosive move here pretty soon. A lot of people have borrowed money to take a long position or a short position, and. The losers, when they lose, they have to sell or they get liquidated. Buy or sell or they get liquidated, and it causes crazy price movements, okay, like ridiculous price movements. Like, like uh, here's a great example. This is actually like, you know, today. Bitcoin goes down, and it breaks past this level, and boom, big candle, this big line here, or this wick here. That is called liquidations. And then likewise, when it went up, people you know, probably thought it was going to keep going down and they opened up a long or they, they probably thought it was going to keep going down. So they shorted it and then it went the other way and just blew everyone back the other direction. That's because of leverage. The reason we have these big movements is because of the derivatives market. You cannot understand how these prices move if you don't understand the derivatives market. Um, you don't have to be an expert on these things, but the reason all of this stuff really moves like sideways especially is because of derivative or not not sideways what i'm trying to say is the reason why it's always moving is because people are are, are taking longs and closing longs opening shorts and closing shorts and when you have a bunch of people do this in one direction and it happens to go in the opposite direction you have what's called a squeeze okay a long squeeze or a short squeeze expect i'm going to zoom out for, for you guys expect for that to happen Okay, here's a great example. Let me get rid of some of this crap here. Look at this. Do you see this ginormous wick? What that meant was, or what this means, this also happened here. The price, people did not think that, that, that Bitcoin was going to go lower than roughly like 43K. They all, a lot of people put in longs with borrowed money and they lost. And what happens is leverage gets flushed out and oftentimes it is absolutely horrendous, horrendously violent. So look at this. After it broke that level, it went down another 20%. Okay. And then went back up, you know, all, like half of that. But that is what we're potentially looking at. Another crazy event like this, but maybe in the opposite direction. We don't know. We just know it's going to be probably volatile. A lot of people are thinking we're going to go and retest uh, this 41, 42K level because we've tested it before. The problem is everyone's thinking we're going to do that. So that's why I, I'm leaning on the side of it might not happen and we might blow everybody else in the opposite direction. A lot of the bears, they're stacking up shorts here and if they lose, it could get violent in the, in the, in the top side, but it could also do the downside. So I'm not, I'm not here to give you any financial advice, but expect some volatility, I think, over the next few weeks. In terms of, um, I'm gonna close with this. There's one thing I wanna mention. I am super bullish on crypto, long term. I will say though, we are in a weird spot now because of traditional finance. Traditional finance is the big daddy, okay, or big mama of crypto. Whether we want to agree it, if it is or not, it doesn't matter. If, if traditional finance crashes tomorrow, crypto will, will crash 10 times harder. We know this, okay? And it's not always in the opposite direction. If TradeFi goes up 10% tomorrow, it doesn't mean crypto will. Okay, a lot, oftentimes it does follow it, but it is almost always uh, correlated in the negative side. So if a trade fight goes down. With the Federal Reserve, okay, with the Fed talking about cutting rates or, or, or raising rates, meaning money that is going to be borrowed 
by big banks and stuff like that, it's going to be more difficult for them to do that. Their interest rates are going to go up. Well, what happens? People sell their stocks, usually equities and other assets, and it creates what's called a deflationary event. Okay. This is what many people believe will happen. I'm not telling you it's going to happen, but because a lot of sophisticated investors, people with big money, hedge funds, institutional investors, because they believe that this is likely, I don't think it's going to be very easy for Bitcoin to just blast back off into these parabolic moves like we saw in 2021. I think we're much more likely to go, if anything, sideways, but maybe even further down. Okay, so until we can get some clarity that basically the S&P 500 is going to keep going up, uh, then I think we, we have this negative lingering narrative in the back of our minds with the Feds potentially um, raising rates. Okay, so this is the macro picture for 2022, unless they come out and say, no, we changed our mind, inflation's okay, and we're going to actually keep rates low. Problem is, they're probably not going to do that because a lot of people are noticing inflation, and a way to control that, or really the only way to control that now, is to raise rates. Okay, interest rates, that is. All right, that's really all we got. Uh, guys, if you like this video, share it. Let me know what you think. I think you can comment on these videos. Um, I would love to know what you guys think. We'll be coming out with some stuff specifically around gaming. I know I keep telling you guys I'm going to release that, but um, we plan on getting that out in the next few weeks. So stay tuned for that. And um, we're going to release another video on Thursday. So stay tuned for that as well. All right, everybody. Until next time, happy hunting, friends.